Oh yeah, I'll have some chips. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Can't touch this. Yep, okay. Can't touch this. I get it. Sorry. Okay. Alright. Can't touch this. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. What can I eat? Can someone please just tell me what I can eat? <sighs> Hi everyone, my name is Adriana Valencia. I am a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist. Today we're gonna to be talking a little bit more about diabetes and nutrition. Now this talk is geared for patients with type two or if you are newly diagnosed type one. We're gonna be talking about carbohydrates and we're gonna be deep diving into what foods, particularly carbohydrates are found in, what a serving of carbohydrates actually looks like, fat and protein, what foods fall into those categories. We're gonna briefly touch on some tips for eating out, and we're also gonna talk about exercise today. First off, we hear the word carbohydrate used all the time, but it's important to think, okay, well, what is a carbohydrate? Well, we know a carb is a food that causes a rise in your blood sugar. Now remember, carbohydrates are your primary source of energy and carbs are not bad. Okay, I get this question often. Carbs are not bad. First, I want you to think of, what do you think are some foods that contain carbohydrates? Think about this question for a second. So these are the food groups that we typically discuss when we talk about foods that contain carbs. We're gonna go through all of these. The first one is grains and cereals. The second one is fruit and fruit juices. The third group is our beans and lentils. Then we have our milk and some milk products, starchy vegetables, and desserts and sweets. Now, think about this question as well. If I have diabetes, I should avoid eating carbohydrates. Do you think this is true or false? Well, it's definitely going to be false. As I mentioned, carbs are not bad. They are a healthy part of our diet. Now, you might have had some of this education in the hospital or remember reading it online somewhere, but I'm gonna to touch on it briefly. One carb serving, one exchange, is 15 grams of carbohydrate. You can think of it, it means the same thing. One carb serving, one exchange equals 15 grams. It all means the same. You can also think of it like money. One carb serving, one exchange, one dollar is 15 grams. So that would mean three servings, three exchanges is 45, four servings, four exchanges, four dollars would be 60 grams of carb. Now, you have to talk with your team, may it be your provider, your nurse practitioner, your dietitian, to see what they recommend for you in terms of your meal goal. So just to keep in mind, they might tell you, hey, you're gonna do 30 grams of carb a meal, that would be two servings, two exchanges. Um, usually you'll be told by your provider to keep your snacks low in carb or carb free. And if you have something called an insulin to carb ratio, which I'm not gonna to talk too much about today, but it just allows you to have carb snacks, just make sure that you cover for them appropriately. Okay, so you'll be hearing these terms used throughout the presentation today. Now, what is an example of a grain or cereal product? I want you to think about this for a second. So I would say that this is the most widely recognized group and this is the group that is gonna contain things like rice, pasta, bread, cereal, English muffins. It's the one that we think of when we think of carbohydrates. Now, why do you think that this group gets such a bad rap? A lot of the times when we talk about this particular group, we always think rice bad, pasta bad, cereal bad, because those can have quite a large effect on our blood sugars. But remember that there's a difference between whole and refined grains, which we'll briefly touch on today. So you can see here that there is a term that you've probably read on the label called whole grain. Now a whole grain product, as you can see here in this little photo, um, examples of that would be whole wheat, oats, barley, popcorn, 
rye, brown rice, or quinoa. Now, whole grains have the entire part of the kernel preserved, so that's gonna provide you with some fiber. A refined grain, there's more processing that's done, basically, so that removes a lot of the fiber content. So a refined grain would be considered white rice, white flour, white bread. Now, you wanna try and aim for whole grains in your diet. And the question that I get often, which can be really confusing, is if I buy brown bread, for example, is that whole grain? And the answer to that is no, not necessarily. You have to make sure that you check the label to make sure that the product that you're getting is whole grain. Now the American Heart Association recommends that half of your grains come from these whole grain sources. Okay, so I will say this, if you're eating foods that are whole grain, it doesn't necessarily mean that the carbohydrates are going to be lower, but fiber has been shown to help reduce cholesterol, can help us keep full longer, and also helps us keep regular. So it is recommended to try and get more of our grain products from that whole grain group, not really for the carbs, but for the other benefits that you get. Now you might think, how can I incorporate this into my diet or my family's diet? There are a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, there are a lot of different grain products as I had listed earlier. Sometimes I tell my patients to also consider um, doing like a white rice mixed with brown rice to start incorporating that in to your, your eating habits. You know, kind of trying different types of whole grain bread. There are a lot of different types of bread available out there too. Those might be some kind of easy ways to transition you and your family into this, into some whole grains. Now, this is gonna get a little bit deeper into a serving of carbohydrates. So I had mentioned that one carb serving, one exchange is equivalent to 15 grams of carb, okay? This is gonna give you some examples of what that looks like. So for example, if you eat one six inch corn tortilla, that's equivalent to 15 grams of carb, okay? Half of an English muffin is equivalent to 15 grams of carb. So if you eat an entire English muffin, that's going to be about 30 grams of carb, which would be considered two carb servings, right? Two exchanges, $2 in that example. Another one that's pretty popular, the tortilla chips, right? About 13 tortilla chips is typically a carb serving as well, 15 grams. This is just to kind of give you an idea about what a serving or exchange actually looks like when you're trying to kind of put together your meal. Now remember, you always wanna check labels as well um, because this is just kind of a roundabout, but not all tortilla chips, right? 13 is not always 15 grams of carb. You have to make sure that you read the label to check that. Now we're gonna transition on to fruits. Remember, I get this question all the time. Just because a fruit is organic or natural or picked from your tree doesn't mean that it does not have carbohydrates. All fruit has carbs, whether it's from a can or from a tree. I will say fruits are not bad, okay? They have a lot of fiber and vitamins, antioxidants. They're, they are an important part of our diet and you don't have to stop eating them if you have diabetes, okay? I do tell my patients that when you're eating fruit, that you really want to try and leave the skin on fruit or vegetables to get some more of that fiber in. Now talking a little more about the fruit group, here's some examples of servings. The fruit group I would say is a little bit more difficult because you can see there, there are so many different types of fruit and the serving sizes vary quite a bit. Uh, half of a banana is usually 15 grams of carb. For example, two mandarins is 15 grams of carb. When you're first starting out trying to be more aware of the carb servings or exchanges or your carb counting, typically you can use a rule of thumb, a tennis ball or a fist size of fruit is usually about 15 grams of carbs. You can kind of use that to start out with. Um, but you can see the fruit does vary quite a bit, but can definitely be incorporated in to be part of a healthy diet. Now I get a lot of questions about juice. Okay, just so you know, four ounces of juice is about 15 grams of carb, which as I mentioned is one carb serving. Okay, there's about 60 calories in that as well. It's really not recommended to have juice unless your blood sugar is low, which is usually less than 70 to help treat it. Juice can really add a lot of calories to your day and carbohydrates. I would much rather you eat the fruit naturally and get more of that fiber versus drinking it in the juice form. So even if you're making the juice at home or purchasing it from a natural food store, I would still rather you actually consume the fruit than drink it in the juice form. 
Now the beans and the legume group, I get a lot of questions about and it can be really confusing because you think, I thought beans had protein. You're right, beans have protein, iron, fiber, probiotics, and they also have carbohydrates. Okay, they are a really good way to add in some protein and they're low in fat, inexpensive, and they can be added into many dishes. But you do still have to count these towards your carbohydrate exchanges or servings. So here's an example of what a, car a carb serving looks like with beans and lentils. Typically half of a cup of beans is, is going to be one carb serving, one exchange, 15 grams. So if you have an entire cup of cooked beans, you're looking at 30 grams of carbohydrates, um, which is two carb servings, two exchanges in that example. But you can see here that half of a cup of beans is seven grams of protein. So an entire cup would be about 14 grams, which is a really good wallop of protein for your meal. So this can be a great way to add in some non-animal based protein sources. Just so you know, if you're doing baked beans because there is added sugar in there, that's a third of a cup is equivalent to 15 grams. That's looking more like rice in that example, right? That's the same amount of carbs that rice has but great way to incorporate in some protein into your diet. Now, milk and milk alternatives can be confusing. Think about what kind of milk do you and your family usually consume at home? So if you drink whole milk or you drink low fat milk, I want you to know the carbs are all about the same. We typically say about eight ounces of cow milk is about 15 grams of carbs. So that's one cup is about 15 grams which is the same as saying one serving, one exchange. Now, if you see here on the slides, there are a lot of different milk alternatives out there now. There's things like almond and soy and hemp and coconut milk available out there. Those can be really good sources of calcium for you. Um, they also tend to be lower in calories depending which one you select and can also be lower in carbohydrates. It's very important with these milk alternatives to really consider, to really look at the label. There are some that have 40 calories a serving and some that have 120. So you really wanna check the label to make a good choice. But these milk alternatives are still a good source of calcium and vitamin D. The difference between the cow milk in compared to the alternatives is typically the protein is lower in these alternative milks. So just check that label, make sure you're making a good choice but these can definitely be added into part of a healthy diet and some of them can be low in carbohydrates so it can be part of a snack, for example. Now milk products, when you're eating something like yogurt, there's a lot of different options on the market now, sim similar to what I mentioned to the alternative milks. Now typically six ounces of yogurt normally is about one carb serving, okay? Like I said, you have to check the label. There are some that are organic, natural, that have much more carbohydrates because they just have much more um, sugar added in. And then other ones, there are single servings that are carb smart that have like eight grams of total carb, for example. Um, cottage cheese is a good low carb snack to usually have as well. That's considered a milk product, but that particular food I always put in the low carb food. So for example, half of a cup is about three grams, which we consider to be a free food. Now, if you like eating yogurt and you wanted to up the protein, you could try doing a Greek yogurt, which is typically higher in protein naturally, or you could try doing a regular yogurt and mix that with a cottage cheese. That will increase your protein intake and reduce your carbohydrates overall as well. So remember, just like with the milk alternatives, you really need to check the label to make sure that you're making a good choice that fits your meal plan. The next group that we're gonna talk about are starchy vegetables. So unfortunately, not all vegetables are created equal. Now I want you to stop and think, what are some examples of your favorite low carb vegetables? And what are some examples of your favorite starchy vegetables? Now we're not gonna talk as much about low carb vegetables today since we're focusing on carb counting, but some really good examples of low carb vegetables would be things like cucumber, bok choy, eggplant, salad, broccoli, spinach. The list is very long. Basically, all of the vegetables I'm not covering in the starchy vegetable group, which we'll discuss further, are, the considered, are considered low in carbohydrates. The following vegetables that I'm going to discuss are not actually considered veggies. We actually consider them 
carbs. Okay, they're not bad, but they should be incorporated into your goal. So for example, if you're eating half a cup of corn or peas or potato, that's typically 15 grams of carb. Now one cup of a butternut or acorn squash is going to be 15 grams of carb. Plantains, a third of a cup is considered 15 grams of carb. So just make sure that you're aware of these. If you have a plate that has beans and corn, make sure that you're counting those as part of your carb goal towards your exchanges, towards your servings, towards your dollars for that meal. Okay, so just make sure you're counting these in. So the other thing that has carbohydrates is going to be our desserts and our sweets. We knew this one already. This is one of the most popular groups as well. So desserts and sweets overall for balanced health, we don't, we recommend just limiting in general, right? If you have diabetes, you can definitely still enjoy desserts and treats. It's, it's okay to do that in moderation. So remember that there's also some good alternatives to desserts out there. So I tell patients, if you really like eating cookies, for example, and if like for me, I love eating Oreos. If I open a pack of Oreos, that pack of Oreos is gonna be gone soon. So one thing that can be helpful is to buy these little portion pack of, they make them in crackers and cookies. That way you can allow yourself to have one incorporated into your carbohydrates as well as part of your meal plan. And you can still have these desserts or treats. Now, if you're gonna do something like go to a birthday party and you know you wanna have a piece of cake, consider just reducing the carbohydrates with whatever meal you're having at that party so that you can enjoy your cake. It's all about the balance. Now, I get a lot of questions about artificial sweeteners. Um, this can be a whole separate topic itself, and I think that there are some um, other slides um, available on TCOID that do talk about artificial sweeteners. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but there are different artificial sweeteners that are approved by the FDA. Um, there are also some like stevia and monk fruit, which are kind of a separate category than what I've listed here for these artificial sweeteners, but are also still proven safe to consume. These do not raise your blood sugar and can be a good alternative to regular sugar. You can also purchase these in a variety of different um, mixes that you can even use for baking now to reduce the carbohydrates of some of your favorite baked desserts as well. Now, proteins and fats are considered low in carbohydrates or free of carbohydrates. But remember, that doesn't mean that they're free of calories, okay? When it comes to protein um, restrictions, if you have a medical condition or um, that might, your provider may tell you to change your protein and fat needs. So for example, if you have an issue with your kidneys, you might hear something about protein restrictions. You need to make sure you talk about that with um, your provider as well. Just keep that in mind. So think about what are some examples of a protein? And I want you to think of what are some examples of a fat? So protein is an important part of our diet. It's the building block in our bones and our muscles. Okay, protein is typically found in animal sources and in some plant sources, as I mentioned, like the beans. Okay, so the low carbohydrate choices for protein are gonna be things like beef, chicken, turkey, fish, eggs, um, cheese, nuts, those are gonna fall under the protein slash fat groups. Okay, so the only time we really worry about cutting something like chicken or beef is if you have breading on it, like chicken tender, or if you have a lot of barbecue or teriyaki sauce because those are sweet sauces. Other than that, we're not gonna worry about counting the, the animal sources towards your carbohydrate count. Now fat, there are different types of fat. There's saturated, there's trans, there's monounsaturated. Um, now, you, just to keep it simple, saturated and trans are what you consider to be the quote unquote bad fats, and mono and poly are what we consider to be quote unquote good fats. So saturated fat is typically found in our animal products, kind of like I talked about earlier, like the beef and the chicken. Um, to kind of try and reduce the amount of saturated fat that you're consuming, you really want to try and aim for those leaner products. Like instead of doing ground beef often at home, you can try doing ground turkey or purchase a leaner cut of that meat um, to reduce your saturated fat just for your overall heart health. Remember, the fat content does not change the carbohydrate content of the meal, but it does change the calories and can affect your heart health if you're eating a large amount of this. 
Okay, so some ways to modify some of your favorite high fat foods could be switching to a lower fat cheese like mozzarella or a 2% version of your favorite cheese, switching over to chicken or turkey meat. Instead of doing a regular pork cut, you could do a pork coin. There's a lot of different ways to cut back on the fat in these particular, in some of your favorite products. Now, monounsaturated fats are the ones that we hear about that are going to be um, things like olive, peanut. These are more oils that have been studied more and have some beneficial properties. So these are the ones that we want to try incorporate in a little bit more into our diet instead of doing as much of the saturated fats. Now to touch on eating out a little bit, I want you to think of what are some of your favorite restaurants. There are a lot of tools available out there that can help you in making healthy choices when eating out and still staying on track on your carb budget per meal. Um, you can always ask for the menu when you're there and a lot of the times the menu has the nutrition information. You can also find a lot of this online. There are also a lot of really good apps that you can use on your phone for free like Calorie King that you can look up things like KFC, Starbucks, um, you can look up Panda Express on there and you can find the carbs of uh, what they have on the menu and then you can make a, a good choice for yourself there. They also do have a Calorie King book that you can purchase um, as well if you don't have a smartphone or you don't like using it as well. So there's a lot of different options to still kind of keep on track when eating out. Now exercise can be something that can be difficult to add in when you're just getting started. It's recommended that people with diabetes get about 150 minutes a week so of, of activity and you can spread that out. You know, when it comes to activity, really the key is to find something that works for you and your schedule. It doesn't have to be anything intense or difficult to start. Even just going for a 15, 20 minute walk is still beneficial for your heart health and your blood sugar control. So trying to get some kind of activity that you enjoy is really the most important thing. So I know we went through a lot of different information today. Um, remember we talked about, the first thing we talked about was carb counting, kind of an introduction to that. So we talked about what foods have carbohydrates, what foods we don't count towards the carbohydrate group. We talked about what a carb serving or exchange looks like. One carb serving, one exchange, 15 grams. We did some examples of that. Um, we also talked about fat and protein, how we don't worry about counting those towards our carbohydrates. And we also talked about activity today. So I know we went through a lot. Make sure that you talk with your diabetes care team regarding your plan or goals for activity and also how many carbs you wanna have per meal or snack. Thank you so much for listening and watching today. I hope that you found some of these tips helpful.